good good morning or uh, good afternoon or good evening wherever you are um this is for c dialogue um, on democratic struggles mm. across southeast asia uh, today we have a very important topic that is that is linked to democratization of various countries across Southeast Asia. That is the suppression of intellectual freedoms, uh, the academic censorship, both blatant self-censorship and other various forms. And I'm Zani and I'm with the uh, 4C and I host this uh, program. And we have um, a very distinguished group of academics and scholars who are engaged also in their own country's democratization efforts or in support of democratic struggles. And we have a Professor Pavin, uh, a, a very prominent Thai academic and dissident, um, now based at Kyoto University, and Pavin's also chief editor of Kyoto Review. Uh, <clears throat> then we have Professor Bowman Gilamo, uh, professor at um, University of the Philippines, uh, Diliman, um, faculty regent of the university uh, until last year, and a longtime labor and human rights activist um, involved in various uh, progressive issues, including closing of US military bases in um, Southeast Asia in his native country, Philippines. And then we have Professor Saskia Wirenga, uh, Emerita Professor at the University of Amsterdam and author of more than 30 books and 200 articles specializing in sexual and gender rights. Uh, he, she is also a very prominent um, human rights activist, human rights educator and trainer, uh, founder of um, Asian Feminist Network with her Indonesian colleagues. We also have in London, uh, Professor Michael Chani, um, one of the, I would say the leading uh, historian of Burma, um, a, a friend of mine over a quarter century. And uh, he is with the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of Washington and a, a very outspoken defender of minority rights in Burma. He has made a major contribution to the defense of Rohingya group identity uh, through his scholarship, as well as uh, lectures around the world. And then in Los Angeles, California, we've got a very committed uh, scholar, uh, Dr. Maestro Bartavarian. Uh, it's one o'clock over there. So I have to salute uh, Meshrov for staying up this late, uh, especially in the middle of um, a deep pandemic crisis in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, he is a visiting fellow at Cornell University Southeast Asia program. And uh, he was educated at the uh, UCLA, uh, I believe historian, and uh, um, uh, finished his PhD at the University of Cambridge. And he's uh, working on a monograph uh, on the Philippines, uh, sp specializing in uh, military affairs, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So I think this subject, you know, academic censorship and um, intellectual unfreedoms, uh, th this is not a new topic, as you know. Um, th you know, I was doing a background research on this subject and the power state or city states or church um, have always without fail attempted to control how people think, what they think. Or going back all the way uh, to several thousand years before the birth of Christ. Uh, you know, the, the one of the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the best known examples is uh, the punishment of Socrates, right? Uh, Socrates was uh, found guilty of poisoning the young minds. 
and uh, uh, and so he took um, <clears throat> the poison. Uh, the, you know, he that was his punishment. And and everywhere in every civilization, you know, uh, every political system, whether it's democratic, uh, totalitarian, Soviet, or McCarthyite, uh, the United States, or you know, a military rule Burma. Um, the censorship regime is there, but that doesn't mean that we have to accept it as something that cannot be changed. What triggered today's conversation is the National University of Singapore Press, NUS Press. As you know, NUS uh, is one of the um, leading universities in Asia and NUS Press specializes on publishing monographs and other academic uh, work, memoirs, whatnot, uh, from within Asia, as well as those who specialized in Southeast Asia and Asia. And our colleague, uh, Professor Pavin from Kyoto University has recently become a victim of this academic censorship regime. He held um, a workshop on um, Thai affairs at Stanford University with a group of leading scholars on Thai studies. And uh, there was absolutely no intellectual ground or scholarly ground for NUS Press to drop his manuscript just before it was ready to be sent to the press for actual printing. So let me invite um, Pavin uh, to, to, to tell us what actually transpired. Uh, your mic is muted. So, okay, thank you so much, Sunny, uh, uh, our moderator today. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would like to emphasize what Sunny just said. Uh, basically, this sort of academic exercise we are doing here uh, mainly uh, inspired uh, or motivated by uh, the, the recent event uh, involving me and the NUS press. Okay, let me uh, start by saying, and I'll try to be, I try to go as, you know, my time limit, about 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, we had uh, this uh, workshop uh, at Stanford in 2017. So the reason we, we mentioned this workshop basically to give legitimacy to this academic gathering, right? You know, at the beginning. So after uh, the, the, the conference at Stanford, uh, I asked all the contributors to revise uh, their chapter. And eventually around August, 2018, we proposed uh, this manuscript to NUS Press uh, to the, uh, the, the chief editor. Uh, his name is Peter Shopper. Uh, I mean, we work, we work with, uh, with Peter rather well, you know, he uh, appeared to be a, a nice guy, an easy guy to work with at the beginning. Uh, he said that the, the man, manuscript was very interest, interesting. So because of that, he would like to consider it, uh, pending uh, the, the, of course, the peer re review process. I said, yes, please uh, go ahead with the peer review. Uh, it took it quite some time. Uh, about six months, then the peer review report came back, positive review with minor uh, revision. Then I asked all the contributors to revise accordingly, uh, according to the, to the suggestion and feedback from the referees. We adhere so closely and strictly to NUS press guideline. There would be no mo moment that we would be you know, criticized for not adhe adhering to the guideline. Uh, and we revised uh, the chapter and submit, submitted them in a timely manner. So by uh, August 2019, uh, NUS accepted the manuscript for publication. And by, uh, by then, uh, I signed a contract with, uh, with NUS Press and also on behalf of other contributors as well. So after the contract, what have, what's supposed to happen was basically the typesetting, the normal process that all the academic had to go through, uh, including uh, the index and also uh, the design and the layout of the book. The ISBN number uh, was issued and 
and U.S. started to advertise this book on Amazon. You still can see the old advertisement still, you know, on on the internet today. The moment that the manuscript uh, was about to go to press, and and literally, I mean, the 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 printing button was about to be pressed. Then I got a phone call from Peter saying that, "Oops, there would be something coming up that it could interfere with." Our decision to publish your publication, but just give. He said, just give me a few days, and I could uh, re reconfirm with you about the final decision. I was a bit shocked, to be honest. I was in London, uh, saying that no. I mean, I would not let this happen uh, because we at the final stage of the project. But then a few days later, when I was, you know, uh, I was back to Kyoto, and then he eventually called me to deliver bad news, saying that. After talking to all the stakeholders of NUS Press, uh, he and also those people came to, to the conclusion that uh, they wanted to withdraw the planned publication without giving any explanation. Right at that point, I think we all knew, you know, including you know the, the back and forth telephone call that NUS was under political pressure. Definitely. What we could not pinpoint then whether whether the the political pressure came directly from the Thai government or indeed was a sort of preventive measure on the part of, of Singapore. It could it could go both way. So I mean I would not want to go into much detail because we really don't know the truth. What I'm what I wanted to say uh, is definitely there would be. Uh, NUS was under political pressure. It could not be any other reason. And in in my personal, you know, messages to uh, to Peter, uh, he also indicate indicated such political pressure. I remember, and I still have it, you know, as evidence that uh, I beg him to argue for my case with the stakeholders, that, with the stakeholders that, you know, in two thousand and six. Uh, a very famous book by Paul Hanley, The King Never Smiles, was also under a similar situation. But luckily, Yale University Press stood up to defend uh, the, the academic freedom. Uh, in, in that case, uh, Yale resisted uh, the pressure from the Thai government. And that's why the book eventually came out. And I said, please, 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 I even begged him to talk to, uh, as I said, the stakeholders. And he said he did try it. So I mean, he admitted that you know there was a kind of political pressure. Anyway, so I was shocked. You know, I I left with uh with almost no choices, uh, only to turn to a few professor in the Thai studies, whom you know kindly introduced me to uh someone at Yale University. So eventually, to cut long story short, uh, I was put in touch with uh with a professor at Yale, and eventually we started this process. One scale all over again. Uh, I was a bit disappointed because uh, at the end, uh, NUS by NUS Press by Peter just released a statement. Uh, I I believe just a few days ago, trying to excuse uh, itself, you know, from the controversy. Uh, for example, uh, you know, this is this was a decision that that was very hard for NUS to make, and also. NUS try very hard to help me find a new home, you know, to my manuscript, which is so untrue, right? NUS and Peter had nothing to do with the later effort, you know, in trying to find a new home uh, for my manuscript. It basically came down to, you know, my own uh, effort and and my connection with any uh, with with other professor in the Thai study. So, okay, I just want to end uh, this this last few minutes by saying that. After that ten months, you know, I remain quiet about NUS because you know I live in fear. I live in fear because if I talk too much, that I got a new contract with Yale, I, I was afraid that the Thai government would use the same kind of pressure against Yale. So I mean, the process would be unending. So I thought to myself that I I I keep quiet for now until the book uh, is published, and then I would you know bring this out to the public, and then the time has come. So the book uh, released just uh, only last week, and then that's why I kick off this campaign. What what campaign is all about? This campaign uh, basically uh, is recommended uh, to me by Professor Michael uh, Hertzfeld from uh, Harvard University. 
you know, he made a very good point. We are not boycotting NUS press. In fact, boycott, that was the, the, the term that I first used. But then I realized that maybe uh, Professor Michael's suggestion might be, might be more appropriate by not uh, boycotting it. What we want to do is basically we would reject an invitation from NUS Press to review manuscript under the consideration of the press for possible publication. Uh, and then uh, through, you know, uh, sort of discussion among groups of academics, we also come up with a time frame. This uh, moratorium on not accepting invitation should last for five years. So it had to be a lengthy period because otherwise, you know, the, me the measure uh, against NUS, you know, would prove to be ineffective. And not only that, NUS would have to come out clean to open up this process for, you know, proper uh, investigation of what really happened uh, behind uh, the, uh, the dropping of my manuscript. Until then, uh, we would go back, you know, to accept uh, the invitation to review manuscript. So that has been uh, the uh, the campaign so far. Uh, I am right now gathering uh, names of academic, you know, so that I can put in the letter. And this let open letter would be submitted to NUS and also NUS Press. We also want to mention in the letter as well that you know, for you know, university like NUS, you know, which has tried so hard in the past decade in order to climb up this international university ranking you know, for you not to have a transparent process for book publication, it would definitely gonna hurt your damage and also your uh, ambition you know, for, to make it for university ranking. So I would like to add it for now and then I would come back you know, uh, to talk about a kind of state in intervention you know, not only in this uh, particular project, but what I have to go through, you know, in the past decade. Uh, this is just another one, another example among many examples. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, th thank you, uh, Professor Pravin. Uh, just uh, one very brief comment. Um, you know, the uh, I have read the uh, public statement uh, by the NUS press uh, chief uh, indicating that, uh, you know, this boycott that you have called for uh, is of personal nature. And I want to, you know, make it very clear that the fact that, uh, you know, that we, all of us, six, uh, you know, scholars, activists, uh, gathered this morning uh, in London uh, time uh, to, is to signal to the NUS and other censorship regimes that, um, you know, the cracking down on academic freedoms uh, in the blatant for, forms of, um, you know, academic <clears throat> uh, repression is not personal at all. There is a principle here that is at stake beyond a single volume, however high quality. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we all are standing up to uh, defend both your academic uh, professional work as well as this principle, you know, the um, however unpopular, uh, inconvenient the ideas and truths and analysis may be to particular political or economic regimes, whether it's Thai authorities or Singaporean uh, economic and political interest uh, intertwined with Thai uh, corporate and uh, political interest. Uh, we are saying that we, you cannot, and no ASEAN state or institution can crack down on the academic freedoms because this is not simply about academics and academia. This is simply about making sure that, uh, you know, honest analyses are made accessible to ASEAN public, Thai and others so that they can make informed decisions. This has direct bearings on the democratization of ASEAN societies. Truth and people's thinking have to be facilitated by scholarship. Yeah, so scholarship is not just simply another career. It has direct bearing on the welfare 
the intellectual and otherwise of different uh, communities across Southeast Asia. Um, let me ask uh, Professor Bowman uh, in Manila. Can you share your thoughts on the academic censorship, uh, the repression of intellectual uh, thoughts and expression in of the Philippines, as well as uh, any other places um, that um, you have uh, firsthand and uh, scholarly uh, interest in? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Zarni. Uh, before I begin, I would like to express uh, my full support uh, for uh, this campaign, which originated with the problem with the publication of Pavin's book by the NUS. So, um, well, uh, there's a history of attacks on academic freedom in the Philippines, particularly during the 50s, which uh, began during that time. But we'll focus at the moment on the present conditions under President Rodrigo Duterte. Uh, first, we have to emphasize that red tagging or red baiting is not an academic matter, as some, uh, some may claim. In the Philippines, can be followed by grave threats, assassination, or illegal arrest and torture. So you will find sometimes your face in some po on, uh, posted with in posters in public areas or uh... Oh man, are you still there? Hello? I wonder if we've lost Bowman um, because uh, his image is frozen. Um, Bowman? Hello? Bowman? Um, okay, I think like we- oh, Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Bowman's back. It's a, Carry on. That's one aspect of this uh, Philippine situation. The internet is really bad. <laughs> yeah, so, maybe, maybe uh, the Philippine state's monitoring your connection. No, I don't think so. It's just totally bad. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, so th there's a culture of impunity also that uh, thousands of people have been killed during the Tertus drug war and no one has been called to justice for this. And activists, uh, human rights defenders are constantly under threat uh, in the Philippines. So I just uh, give a few examples of uh, academic uh, of incursions on academic freedom, uh, recent ones uh, during the Duterte uh, regime. So in October 2018, the, Philipp the Philippine Armed Forces began spreading rumors about an Operation Red October. The Philippine Army spokesman said that communists have been recruiting students for a long time, but the ongoing recruitment has been heightened because of uh, the said plan. He listed several universities in Metro Manila such as the University of Philippines, et cetera, all of the major universities, he said, were hotbeds or breeding grounds for communists. And he said that they are inciting students to protest over the issues of the extrajudicial killings. This was a time when so many when thousands of people were being killed during Duterte's drug war. And um, they said also that uh, the activists are using film showings of movies and documentaries about the martial law period under the dictator, President Marcos, to incite students to rebel against the government. So a lot of filmmakers were also incensed by this. They're now, uh, you know, uh, identified means for inciting students. And uh, another uh, important uh, development was in October 2019. Uh, there was a Senate resolution uh, filed by Duterte Ally in the Senate. And uh, that was a kind of, that to investigate uh, the um, uh, let's say, subversive um, activities in universities and schools. So they came out with a committee report number 10. I just want to show certain parts of this so that you can see how, how, in, uh, how invasive this, this is. Um, number one, uh, this was committee report number 10, uh, submitted jointly by the Committee on Public Order and Dangerous Drug Defense and Security, Peace, Unification, and Reconciliation. So they said that uh, while the committee values and recognizes the right to expression and academic freedom, the exercise of these rights should observe lawful limitations and should not at any time sacrifice the rights and interests of the youth who may end up as armed combatants in the communist groups. In coordination with the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police, school administration with a continuing program 
where a lecture series on how to detect insurgency elements in schools will be included in the authorized activities of schools and universities. There should be a regular review of academic curriculum and modules, monitoring and evaluation of school activities. They said, mining the right to academic freedom and recognizing the autonomous or deregulated status of education institutions, DepEd, uh, Dep Department of Education and the Com Commission on Higher Education must exercise its regulatory and supervisory powers in reviewing schools curricula, curricula syllab syllabi, and or daily lesson logs to ensure that principles and values of patriotism, etc., are being taught. And it includes that there should be investigations of allegations against teachers. The Department of Education and the Commission on Higher Education should issue an administrative order mandating school administrators to initiate thorough administrative investigations on the allegations against teachers who instigate their students to participate in rallies and street demonstrations that advocate radical and subversive ideologies. Should the facts and evidence warrant, appropriate administrative sanctions should be meted out. So uh, uh, the Commission on Higher Education and the Department of Education should look into the possible liabilities of school administration and teachers. So they can be charged for actually violating uh, these uh, new uh, regulations that are being proposed. So very recently, there have been several pro professors which have been uh, red tagged and red baited in the Philippines. Last December, there was a professor at the University of Santo Tomas, the oldest university in Asia, uh, who, who, who experienced a torrent of uh, red tagging uh, because of his uh, anti-Duterte position. And we've had this all over the Philippines, in Mindanao, in Cebu, in, Dilima, in, in, in Diliman, everywhere. All, almost all uh, chap, um, um, units of the University of the Philippines, uh, you have experienced um, red baiting and red tagging of professors. You can see some professors, they, they have their faces on posters being posted in public, uh, being disseminated in Facebook and accused of being uh, communist. So uh, this is made worse. This whole thing was made worse by the passing of the Philippines anti-terrorism law last uh, July. So this law greatly the definition of terrorism. So it says that inciting others through speeches, writings, proclamations, emblems, banners, and other representations tending to the same end could carry a punishment of 12 years in prison. So you see, uh, this is a very broad definition of terrorism. Uh, you, you have speeches and writings, proclamations, something that you can, you know, that could be used against teachers. So the National Union of People's Lawyers petitioned the Supreme Court to overturn the law. And I also, as the former uh, faculty region of the University of the Philippines, we have a a petition against this uh, anti-terrorism law. There are, at least, there are at least 31 petitions in the Supreme Court now uh, contesting this law. So things are getting worse because uh, these, um, these new uh, rules and regulations and laws uh, legalizing uh, uh, violations of academic freedom and, the right, and, uh, and violating the right to free speech uh, is now intensifying in the Philippines. So, uh, it is academic freedom in the Philippines is under grave threat. And it's uh, not just uh, the problem of publishing books here. It's actually a life and death uh, matter for many academics. So thank you, that's all. Yeah, I think the, you know, the, the French uh, philosopher, uh, Voltaire said, that, you know, the uh, basically uh, ideas have uh, uh, consequences. And so, you know, the, the regimes um, that controlled uh, what people should think and and how they should think uh, feel threatened uh, you know it looks like the the Philippine scenario is extremely severe uh, you know I also understand that you know the Filipino regimes is going after uh, the human rights lawyers yeah? and the, this whole uh, you know framing of um, <clears throat> you know academics and scholars who attempt to write about uh, you know, the, the different uh, rebellious movements, uh, the, the explanations and scholarships that try to get to the root of uh, uh, popular rebellions and re revolts, 
has been framed as part of terrorism or sympathetic to terrorism. You know, it, it, it's happening in Turkey as well. And so if we want to uh, leave our own um, the region of special interest, Southeast Asia, um, in, I, I was in, um, <clears throat> I was visiting the uh, uh, JNU campus in New Delhi at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Modi regime is um, appointing administrators who would strip off or end uh, political intellectual traditions in uh, some of the um, um, India's um, best known <clears throat> um, top universities. So can I uh, ask uh, Professor Saskia uh, the, to share her thoughts on her work, uh, but she also, uh, you know, <clears throat> spent um, time as a visiting research fellow at NUS, uh, but uh, the, her work uh, concerns that uh, sexual and uh, gender rights in Indonesia and across uh, Southeast Asia. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Zarni. And also thank you, uh, Pavin, for bringing all this uh, to the public. Because indeed in Southeast Asia, and of course I'm talking especially about Indonesia, surveillance, academic surveillance and terrorism uh, uh, con uh, <coughs> concerns are, uh, bec because of this so-called terrorism concern, are uh, increasing. I will go back like Bowman. Uh, to history a little bit, in this case to 1965 in Indonesia, uh, when uh, a genocide occurred after the military abduction of some generals, which was blamed on the Communist Party. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, in that genocide, uh, almost a whole generation of progressive intellectuals was lost. Either they were uh, in the country and they were killed or imprisoned there, or they were exiled when they, uh, some of them were, many of them, thousands of them were studying abroad and they could never return. Um, total impunity for this genocide, total impunity for, for what happened. And no one ever has been brought to court. That's why we had the International People's Tribunal uh, <clears throat> on, this, on these mass crimes against humanity in 2015. Um, and the surviving uh, student and academic population was deeply intimidated. When I did my first research uh, on labor conditions in Indonesia in the uh, mid 70s, I was struck by the total uh, uh, yeah, censorship of all academic work on this particular issue of the labor conditions, which, uh, which was um, obligatory to say how wonderful the new order, that's the regime of the General Suharto was and how much progress there was. Although the data in these theses and books pointed to the different direction. So under the new order, that's the, um, the regime of General Suharto, there was a strict control also of research visa. So internally, in, um, there was hardly any possibility for progressive research, but externally also uh, research uh, researches were strictly controlled. For instance, uh, uh, the whole uh, University of Monash for a few years was banned from getting research visa. Um, this resulted in self-censorship abroad of all these uh, Indonesian study centers abroad. And in my case, what I experienced is was uh, when in 1986, uh, there was a big conference on gender issues in Indonesia, and I presented my first results on the communist women's organization in Indonesia. Uh, my article, uh, like Pavin's article, was banned just before the book went to press. Um, and I myself received death threats and was uh, blacklisted from the country for 13 years. Uh, but what was most uh, uh, well said in this whole process was that the attitude of the Dutch University, in this case KTLV and Leiden University, which was um, not supporting me in any way and was even uh, uh, banning me, calling me a rebel, an activist, and not an academic, not a proper academic, because if I would have been a proper academic, I would have done something different or something like that. So the self-censorship and also the uh, expulsion and the repulsion of academics working on 1965 in Indonesia actually um, persisted until uh, 1998, when Indonesia itself was going through a democratic opening. But by that time, within Indonesia, a whole generation, 32 years, right, 
uh, lasted this uh, this uh, this dictatorship of General Suharto, a whole generation of brainwashed academics had by that time come to the uh, to the fore and had become in had come into leadership positions they, and they had become the ad university administrators. So they, in their turn, then suppressed the, uh, the 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 progressive students who were trying to move out from under the censorship. So. <clears throat> students and academics were still intimidated. And in 2004, there was an important case of uh, a whole revised curriculum for history, including 1965, was burned. And there were many book bans still in this democratic opening. And at this moment, still the career prospects for progressive intellectuals in the country is limited. So although there is a democratic opening in Indonesia, the academic um, uh, space for progressive intellectuals is very small, it's very limited. And at this moment also surveillance and particularly the uh, uh, censorship laws uh, are, uh, are really um, uh, impediments to progressive research. Although of course there are still some very brave intellectuals who dare to, uh, to, pro to, to do their own research. But at this moment, uh, foreign researchers, again, are constrained as in a similar ways, but of course more sophisticated than under the new order. The first indication was a few years ago uh, when all of a sudden the, the site of Lubang Buwaya, which is the most important memorial site for the genocide, was closed to foreign researchers. They could only uh, access uh, this site because it has been uh, a topic of, of much criticism uh, uh, by uh, for particularly foreign researchers, but of course also internal researchers, uh, if they had a particular letter from the military authorities. The latest in this uh, area of repression and surveillance is that uh, research permits have to be granted before any researcher can come into the country. These research permits are very difficult to get and they have to run uh, past the security services and also that any visa uh, and particularly of course uh, visitors visa and research visa now goes through an electronic process in which 80, uh, 8, 0, 80 government institutions are involved, including all the, all the security services. This makes it almost impossible for progressive researchers or for anybody who has any kind of record of dissent or interest in the impunity with which the state still regards uh, uh, the 1965 issue. And of course, the impunity is not only in relation to the 65 issue, but it also to many other human rights uh, issues like the 1998 um, killings of students. And particularly now, the same impunity with which the military has, uh, has enjoyed for so many years is still evident, of course, in the impunity with which uh, activists and uh, journalists and whoever else is against uh, what's happening in West Papua are being killed, uh, imprisoned, and uh, and are being anyway banned from entering even uh, in West Papua. So impunity in the country extends to all kinds of human rights violations in Indonesia, and all kinds of progressive voices uh, are uh, increasingly being surveyed and stifled in Indonesia. This is the situation right now. Thank you. It, it looks like, you know, the uh, <clears throat> the struggle for um, intellectual freedoms and uh, more uh, specifically academic freedom uh, continue on. You know that you you are referring to 1965, and as I understand it, across Southeast Asia, the um, uh, <clears throat> historical memories of uh, how past uh, authoritarian or neo-totalitarian regimes treated their own citizens um, have not been properly uh, recorded and a new generations of uh, ASEAN um, citizens grow up not knowing uh, you know, what transpired across the border. And many of us learn about Nazi Germany uh, you know, more so than say like uh, 1965 genocides uh, against the Chinese Indonesians and the uh, communists uh, by uh, Suharto regime or Khmer Rouge. And so I think that is why the, um, 
uh, the, the, the fight for, uh, you know, academic freedoms is so crucial. Um, can I ask uh, uh, Professor Michael Charney from SOAS uh, to share his thoughts? Um, he specializes in military histories as well as the uh, 16th and 17th century uh, Burmese uh, pre-colonial history. And, um, you know. Well, thank you, Zarni, and I'm glad to be here and I give my full support to, uh, to Pavan on this. Um, across long history and uh, of universities, and I'm not just speaking about the modern universities that began in Italy, but also the early proto universities at Nalanda and Gundishapur and elsewhere. Um, for thousands of years then, uh, universities were actually given to parochialism, the teaching of religion, uh, the education of noble sons to do and think exactly as their fathers had done and their peers would do. Uh, the university was a place where, where thinking, where, where their brains were mapped according to what we could call state think. Um, and I'm here applying James Scott's concept of state space uh, to patterns of thinking in a way that made thinking easy to conform to the state, to run the state, and to lead the state. The unspoken part of this process uh, was learning how to control, suppress, and exploit the vast majority of the population. And so when we look at Southeast Asia, colonial authorities knew this when they introduced colonial universities in the, in the decades up to and, uh, and just after World War I. And these were to teach the colonial mother tongue, European ideas and values, and both uh, uh, in obedience uh, and the figurative, uh, 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 figure, both literal and, and figurative obedience to the state and uh, through the provision of certain kinds of uh, knowledge and behavior. Select Southeast Asian youth of means and merit would walk in elite children and walk out colonial bureaucrats, military officers, and Commodore elites. They saw or were meant to see the world as sharply defined, hierarchically stacked ethnic minorities, right and wrong moral and sexual behavior, uh, the legitimacy of the huge global and racial disparities in wealth, and just why Southeast Asians on the whole deserve to be disempowered uh, economically and politically. Um, and why, and, and as you know, we're dealing with, with decolonizing now, uh, why the indigenous mode of thought was inherently inferior to the Western mode of thought. And this is when that beautiful moment occurred when Southeast Asians found in their education all the things the colonial state did not wish them to see, learned about revolutionary ideology, why the global disparity in wealth was a result of slavery and exploitation and why their own modes of thought were not inferior. And universities in Southeast Asia, they trained, they definitely trained the governing and commercial elites but they also produced the revolutionaries and thinkers who would effectively lead their countries to victory in Burma and Vietnam and Indonesia and against absolute kingship in Thailand in 1932. My, my point here is to make three specific, very specific points. First of all, uh, first, Southeast Asian universities like universities in many former colonies have been des designed to be places for state think. Universities in the region were usually founded by colonial states or post-colonial independent states, not to encourage free and critical thought, but to service the state and populate a gentleman's club of bureaucrats, officers, and business leaders. The primary mission of these universities remains for them to be centers, not of the development of critical thinking, but merely places to teach their students what to think rather than how to think, to reinforce an imaginary in which certain political and economic elites are dominant as the only possible and acceptable world in which to live and to suppress any de deviation from, from conformity. My second point is that Southeast Asians everywhere, as students and academics, have always struggled in universities to carve out spaces to challenge these efforts to explore, experiment, and to question. The Southeast Asian University, if it is successful not as a state project, but as a historical phenomenon, is a battleground where the state think can be challenged and students, when they leave, as conform, at, whether as conformists or as revolutionaries, have at least had the opportunity to question the order of things and change even just a little, they come out better able to make their own choices as a result. This is the historically conditioned role of universities and this is in the region and this is this development is one of many features of the rival uh, that, that we, we use to mark the rival of a free and open society or movements in that direction. So yes, the attempt to post state thinking universities is true uh, in these as well, uh, because it comes out, comes out of bureaucratic rationality and not social morality. So I'm not worried about states trying, trying to determine what universities teach. Again, there are historical reasons why this expectation by government elites is valid. And we see this in Western universities too. Uh, now my third point 
is that while universe governments and democratic and democratic aspiring societies have one version of state think that can tolerate a fairly high level of contravention, authoritarian military governments have less tolerance, almost none. The 1960s, 1980s saw many of the regimes in some countries somewhat longer, and then a return uh, in later decades to earlier civilian governments and the universities returned to normalcy. The retreat of democracy in the last half decade across the region, however, or the return to quasi-authoritarianism as we see in Myanmar since 2017, has created the trend I am most worried about today. What is working against the historical role of universities across Southeast Asia today is the increasingly effective closing up of what we might call the intellectual counter spaces of both students and academics by the invisible hands that will call for the moment stakeholders. This is the critical moment when universities go from saying this, uh, this is what the state wishes to teach you, to this is what the state limits your understanding to be. And they cancel the contract for a book that showed a different way to view one of the societies in the region. Worryingly, I think this trend, especially with the apparent success of many authoritarian states in controlling uh, COVID-19, is the trend that we're, we're going to continue heading into. What students and academics and universities globally need to do, not just in the West, but in Latin America, Africa, and elsewhere, is to help students and academics in Southeast Asian universities defend their intellectual counter spaces in their own universities through pressure, such as the reviewing boycott that Pavan is, oh, we're not calling it boycott now, such as the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the moratorium, and pro by providing, perhaps virtually, a lifeline that reaches over the military picket and the invisible shields of the authoritarian minded stakeholders. And I'll stop it there, thanks. I think now I, I would like to request uh, Dr. Maestro Batavarian in Los Angeles um, to share his thoughts on um, self-censorship. And then I, I, I want to um, say a few things about my own country of Burma and what I went through uh, as a university student in, uh, under the military. Um, uh, Maestro. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for inviting me and I'm uh, happy to take part and I do indeed fully support uh, Pawin's uh, case indeed. With regard to a more insidious form of checks, um, more subtle, less crude perhaps than canceling contracts or pulling books off of shelves. There is this phenomenon that I have seen, particularly with regard to uh, Philippine scholars in certain very interesting contexts of self-censorship. In other words, the notion that uh, the potential dangers of speaking or straying in a certain direction, usually a progressive um, anti-authoritarian direction, can result in extremely unpleasant and confining uh, social encounters. So just to give you some personal uh, experiences that I had with Filipino scholars in the United States coming on speaking tours or, and also investigative journalists, Raisa Robles, who wrote a book on martial law in the Philippines published uh, shortly before Duterte came to power, uh, giving a talk at UCLA in the summer of 2017 was disrupted by Duterte trolls, um, not just on her social media accounts, but during the actual lecture itself. Several times after she left UCLA, she gave uh, other lectures at Berkeley and um, across the US, being uh, heckled, uh, interrupted, asked rude and irrelevant questions of this nature. Uh, this is something that has prompted a, uh, not, Raisa Robles, but certain other Filipino intellectuals have uh, been cowed or restricted their range of criticism as I think a result of these sorts of heckling uh, incidents. What's interesting to me is that because of the pandemic now, we cannot be interrupted in this space. We, have a, we can publicize this dialogue, this conversation without fear of it being heckled, interrupted or twisted in some weird way. Naturally, we get uh, very strange comments once these things are posted on YouTube in, in certain respects. But uh, I always find it very interesting that because of this Zoom uh, culture we've entered in academia, 
we cannot be heckled by definition because we only invite people who we are, <laughs> are trustworthy of uh, in that sense. What I also see uh, in terms of the psychological aspects of self-censorship and misinformation and uh, misdirection of thinking in certain countries, certainly in the Philippines, also in Thailand uh, and Indonesia is a Cold War uh, lineage and legacy to this. The massive role played by uh, American intelligence agencies, uh, military organizations, in facilitating what is called in the literature a kind of indirect form of counterinsurgency. In other words, you are encountering insurgent spaces, insurgent movements that must not just be pulverized by direct applications of military power, but the, uh, the inculcation, the organization of misinformation organizations like ISOC in Thailand, like various intelligence units in the, in the Philippines itself, massively supported by the United States right through the Cold War. And I think some of what we are seeing today in certain countries, perhaps, I mean, Burma has a more indigenous origin to these sorts of uh, psychological warfare operations, but certainly in Thailand and the Philippines and, and, and even Indonesia, I would say, the legacies of this Cold War uh, counterinsurgency doctrine, counterinsurgency thinking, and the knowledge systems that counterinsurgency constructs in the 1940s, 50s, all the way really until the end of the 1980s, continues uh, to the present day. Now, that could be because these forms of knowledge, these forms of misinformation and intimidation were localized, this is a very popular term in Southeast Asian studies, the localization of exogenous uh, knowledge systems or ideologies by local actors, or indeed uh, there is a, I think in the Philippine case, not uniquely, but certainly uh, most extensively, there is a continuity of involvement with uh, US intelligence and military organizations that persist in uh, linking itself to these militaries, to these intelligence organizations. And it's not necessarily that the US is intending for these outcomes, if, but if these outcomes follow, well, then they just follow. This is the price of doing business with uh, regimes or militaries in which the United States has a uh, strategic interest. So I think these two concepts of self-censorship brought about by a intimidating and unpredictable atmosphere, whether on social media or indeed, say, certainly before the pandemic, during public speaking engagements uh, has to be considered and also this the exogenous origin of that. Well, I, I would also like to make one further point, however, in that um, in, the, in Pawin's case, my reading of the efforts to censor the volume have not worked uh, simply because uh, the, the volume was picked up by a, a I mean, let's, let's just say it out loud, <laughs> Yale, a very prestigious press, uh, gave the volume a, a cachet and an audience wider than I think might have been the case with just an NUS press publication. And the efforts to block it publicized the case further. So uh, just to give you uh, another example, there are inexorable tendencies. And I think, say, uh, recent attempts to disrupt the transition of power in the US failed uh, miserably because uh, of these very clumsy efforts to, to disrupt, I think something that is already inexorable, already has a momentum of its own and ultimately proved counterproductive for the forces trying to disrupt the transition. And I think this too will prove quite counterproductive for the forces in question trying to censor and block because Thai civil society or elements of civil society in Thailand already have a, a progressive momentum, a progressive tend and, tre and uh, tendency that uh, efforts to stifle it in these clumsy sorts of ways are, are, are going to prove rather counterproductive. And I think in Pawin's case, they have proven very counterproductive. Um, 
Th thank you, Maestro. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we we are actually today um, uh, on the uh, 4C um, dialogue on democratic struggles across Southeast Asia, uh, discussing there's a very vital subject of uh, how states across South Southeast Asia uh, attempt to control what people think and how people think. And uh, I can, uh, oh, um, you know, I have lived under uh, Burmese military dictatorship for a quarter of a century, 25 years before I left uh, for the US for my uh, further studies. And I can attest to, uh, you know, from my own personal experience, uh, uh, the, the extreme case, uh, not simply uh, censorship, Basically, we are, you know, the, in the in the 1960s and 70s, where Burma was completely cut off from the entire world, and, you know, counterculture movements, anti-Vietnam War, youth protest in the U.S. and uh, Europe, Australia, uh, and also other uh, ideological and intellectual flow or current uh, that had enveloped the world in the 60s and 70s. The the Burmese military. Um, uh, um, committed, um, you know, one of the uh, greatest and most impactful uh, societal crimes. That is that uh, it essentially dismantled entire uh, departments of social sciences. So we did not have sociology. We did not have political science. We did not have uh, economics as such. Yeah. And uh, the, the Mike, uh, who specialized in Burma, would know that uh, the uh, university libraries are extremely tightly controlled and uh, there will be hundreds of thousands of Burmese university graduates who had never ever set their foot in an academic library and uh, you know certain uh, books uh, uh, cannot be ac or could not be accessed in those days and and one of the major uh, you know, devastating impacts of this kind of blatant, uh, you know, uh, sensory. I mean, we're we're talking about dismantling entire, uh, you know, social science departments that were to provide, uh, you know, food for thought, modes of thinking uh, for the younger generation Burmese men and women, as well as um, uh, you know, minority, ma uh, majority, ethnically and religiously. Um, so we today have a situation where you know entire generations of Burmese more or less have been raised uh, without the ability to think for themselves. So we have a situation where you know the uh, um, Burmese civil society has become uncivil in the sense that um, we do not act in a civil and humane ways towards uh, communities, large communities such as Rohingyas or the Kachin Christians or others whom the state that now, um, you know, quasi a democratic state um, jointly run by Aung San Suu Kyi and the Burmese military, uh, whom the state consider, uh, you know, enemies of the state, say for instance, Rohingyas uh, in the case of uh, uh, <clears throat> the contemporary uh, Burma have been framed as, you know, basically invaders, illegals and Islamists and whatnot. And so the, the, instead of looking at facts and developing their own conclusions, the, the majority of the Burmese public go with the state while calling themselves uh, human rights activists and defenders. And so, you know, also uh, as uh, some of you are aware that in 2013, uh, you know, actually this month, uh, January, I resigned openly uh, the, from the University of uh, Brunei uh, the, for the university's uh, blatant attempt to gag me. You know, it was uh, the early days of the last uh, phase of the uh, genocide uh, against the Rohingyas. And I, I was actually one of the very few um, uh, you know, uh, scholars of uh, Burmese or otherwise who started to uh, you know, pick up on the signs of a full-fledged uh, state-directed genocide against the Rohingya Muslims and also the military's attempt to mobilize um, uh, Islamophobia uh, as a way of uh, <clears throat> you know, basically um, uh, desensitizing the Burmese public from the human rights discourse that was uh, uh, enveloping uh, the civil society. And, 
if I were allowed to, um, you know, <clears throat> to, to basically share my scholarship and findings from my research with the wider ASEAN societies, you know, particularly, uh, um, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia and other places, uh, you know, we would have had a greater, uh, you know, early mobilization against the Burmese genocide. So today we have across Southeast Asia, um, you know, out of 10 or 11 countries, uh, if we include Timor-Leste, um, <clears throat> we have large numbers of uh, uh, Southeast Asians who can be swayed by, uh, you know, uh, state ideological manipulation. Yeah, and so I think that this issue is not simply confined to the um, uh, ivory tower and academics who work within the tower, but it it, it has direct and devastating impact on the development of democratic and pro-human rights values and modes of thinking across Southeast Asia. So let me, let me just invite all of you for, this, uh, for a free flow of uh, discussion. Uh, but, you know, anyone uh, who wants to go first, uh, please raise your uh, hand. Yes, uh, Pavin, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Sunny. And I would like to add on uh, what uh, Mesrop just said about the the failure of uh, either the Thai government or Singapore press, you know, to block uh, this book. Uh, obviously, for the reason that you said. I mean, unlike unlike other speaker today, I did not you know talk about the history of academic censorship in Thailand. But just enough to say, I, I have like small four points. I I promise it won't be long. Ban book. You know what? I mean, 2021, why are we still talking about banned book? You know, I, I find it so absurd, right? When, you know, with the internet, with the social media, you ban something, it appears elsewhere. So that's why, I mean, this is something that I think state and also uh, traditional uh, academic publisher like NUS would never understand that, you know, even if you block, you refuse, you know, to publish certain critical manuscript, it would never work, you know, in 2021. So uh, in Thailand, you know, even though it, it doesn't work, Thai government continue to ban certain books. For example, The King Never Smile, you know, to the point that if you have it in your possession, you would be arrested. You know, a Thai guy translated just only a few paragraphs. He was put in prison for a few years. So, I mean, the state could go to that, to that extent, you know, to deal with banned books. But I think it is an exercise which has been counterproductive. Uh, uh, second point about language. Uh, I think, in fact, the Thai government would not mind so much if critical manuscript would be produced in the English language, because they still believe that you know a lot of Thai would not be able to read. So that's why, in my own assumption, uh, the the blocking or the or the last minute cancellation on the part of NUS Press, it might just be about the the, the precaution on the part of Singapore rather than any direct uh, uh, pressure from the Thai government. And we know how Singapore uh, has operated anyway. Maybe Saskia, you, you might be able to say something. And I live in Singapore for nine years. So uh, the language thing, I mean, and I talked to Sunny before about us trying to promote Southeast Asian languages, you know, in, in our speaking, in our uh, publication of article, because I think this is the way of allow it to be to be accessible, you know, for uh for indigenous, you know, Southeast Asians. Uh, that's why, Sunny, when you said that, you know, the state try to control what we supposed to think and what we're not supposed to think. I think with the widespread of you know Southeast Asian languages, uh, it might help, even though you know it might not be directly involved into the discussion today. But I think uh, it's important to mention about the accessible of languages when it comes to academic publications. The third point about state intervention, uh, and I think this is also in my case, is not just about to stop publication like that. The state could go to the extent, for example, you know, uh, right after the coup, you know, I, I was wanted by the government. And then when I was invited to speak, I remember so well, I gave this talk at LSE, and then I could see a number of, you know, uh, embassy, uh, people sitting in, in, in uh, with the crown, and then that's all that also a way for them to try to obstruct, you know, 
my lecture, you know, by eventually getting standing up and say, you know, what you are speaking basically is not correct. This is, you know, the, 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 the true version of the situation, something like that. It went also to another extent to try to force last minute cancellation again. This happened at University of Frankfurt and I managed to make a, a big story out of it, you know. Uh, oh my God, I just screamed in front of the classroom when they tried to, uh, when they tried to stop uh, the lecture from happening. Just one, one tiny point. They are able to do so because I think Southeast Asian studies, you know, when you compare with any other big, you know, study, for example, like Chinese studies, Japanese study, we are small. When we are small, we do not have adequate funding. When we don't have adequate funding, we tend to rely on the embassy overseas in order to finance, you know, Thai study center, for example, Indonesian study center elsewhere. And because of that, they can have a hand on what they want it to ha happen to appear. So that's why they, they're quite angry with, with, with Frankfurt University to use their money in order to invite me. So what I try to say is that the, the, the state, you know, could once again, not just only to stop publication, but could also interfere into the actual lecture. The last point, solidarity among the academia. And I can speak this, you know, uh, from the latest exercise, the campaign. I sent an email to 230 scholars. I'm sure all of you received my email. Right now I got a yes from 80 scholars. Okay, it might still be early in the day because this is just only the second day of the campaign. And I expect that you know, more people in that list will continue to, to support this campaign. But this is also a test. This is also a test as well that when it comes to a situation like this, whether we will manage to bring up a kind of solidarity among academics. I mean, privately, a number of people dropped me uh, an email saying that, look, I really support you, but I can't put my name down. You know, it could be because of, you know, it could jeopardize their career, you know, because they already work with NUS you know, in certain projects. Uh, well, I mean, there is a fine line. How far you can go to defend academic freedom? Especially, I would like to leave this final message to say that, if it never happened to you, you would never know it. So if freedom would never be taken away from you, you know, you think it is okay until it really happened to you. I just hope that my case, you know, would be a good example and it could happen to anyone. So that's why I think solidarity among the academic community is very important in this exercise. Thank you. Um, the floor is open to uh, all of you. And so if anyone wants, um, please jump in. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So, um, well, another form of sense to add to what Tavin said about, you know, it's uh, banning books is kind of uh, obsolete because uh, if, if a book is banned, it can actually be just uploaded. And that was the case when a book, uh, I was in the, um, when one of the, one book, which was uh, translated into Bahasa Indonesia, about the 1965 massacres was had just been released, and uh, the uh, that book is going to be censored. It's not allowed any kind of uh, distribution. So the publisher immediately, you know, just after receiving this uh, this news of uh, that, that 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 book would be banned, immediately uh, instructed uh, his friends to upload it to the. So I think it's just it doesn't make any sense anymore to just say that you know that. You know, we're going to ban that book because it's almost impossible uh, in these societies today. But I'd like to talk about or add another point about another kind of censorship. Um, you know, the commercial kind of censorship that uh, sometimes, uh, like uh, the excuse that they use for, for Pavin, that, uh, you know, the NES having trouble, you know, up unloading its books, you know, so that we can't publish another volume on this topic. So uh, another pretext for uh, censorship or another reason for it actually is the uh, highly commercialized nature of publication today, even of university presses. So uh, some university presses will tell you that, you know, we can't sell this book, so we can't publish it, no matter how high the quality of scholarship of that work is. Um, uh, I had one experience of this, but it's uh, rather different. But uh, for example, a, um, uh, I submitted a book to a press, a major press here in the Philippines, and they said, you know, this book is just too intellectual, you know. No Filipino reading Filipino, the, our language, 
could understand this so that uh, and you know English readers won't read it all at all uh, also, also they won't read it at all because it's in Filipino so that's another kind of censorship which also Pavin um, made a point if you publish in English you could actually almost publish anything because uh, the ordinary people they won't read that they won't be able to read that book. So, uh, but uh, if you try to publish something that could reach a broader population on a deeper level of thought, then uh, they say, you know, they, the Filipinos, they only read about jokes and sex. And that's all that we want uh, to publish. So that's another aspect of, uh, let's say a more subtle kind of uh, censorship. And there's also another one, uh, um, you know, that, that in universities, uh, in our neoliberal universities, uh, there's a lot of uh, competition, a lot of uh, efforts, you know, to go up the academic ladder. So, uh, you know, academics will not try, will not risk uh, their uh, the possibility of publishing in in major presses or or in specific journals because they were they're talking about topics which may not be actually uh, attractive or may be too contentious for these uh, for these uh, channels of publication. The, the pressures of our uh, neoliberal academe is actually affecting uh, the way also that our academics are, are doing research and, and towards a certain sucker. So uh, maybe these, uh, these kinds are more subtle, but today. Yeah, Saskia, you want to um, uh, intervene or Mike, um, are, are you next in line or which one? No, I'm, I'm happy for Saskia to have. Oh, well, I'm just making a very small point in addition to what Pavin and uh, Bowen are saying is uh, also the, the censorship uh, executed by um, boards of administrators very clearly for political purposes, um, which Pavin also says. And I'm very glad to see that uh, of, of this campaign because uh, uh, so many instances have gone unpunished and, and people just withdrew or whatever. Um, but there's also an issue that is, um, I think, vitally important, particularly for younger researchers, is that these same administrators um, also usually, or senior academics, uh, also usually control uh, uh, boards or funding agencies, right? And, and, and they, um, in many cases, are able to pr effectively prevent critical scholars, critical young scholars, from accessing any funds that may endanger whatever the policy is of that particular uh, funding agency. And I think that control is becoming more and more um, uh, effective, also because at this moment, uh, these boards, uh, these boards which control the funding, are more and more and more involved in the actual content of what they are funding. I mean, uh, when I was trying for funding uh, in the uh, in the late 70s, uh, you could just propose any kind of topic. In my, in my case, it was anyway uh, not possible because of, of uh, conservative people uh, um, uh, um, not allowing this kind of funding to continue. But, but I mean, at least I could propose a topic of my liking. Now, if you're a young scholar, you have to already write into a particular uh, proposal that is put forward by your funding organization and which limits your capacity to look outside of the boundaries of that, of that already propo proposal, which is already set up for you uh, in significant ways. And so you're already predisposed, if you want funding, that is, I mean, I never managed to get funding for research on human rights in Indonesia, on communism or on sexual rights, never ever <laughs> through the regular board. Um, but now you, you, if you want that, you can't get it if you are a progressive independent scholar working on topics that are not in line with the particular priorities that is set by the funding boards. And I think that is also a very worrying uh, development. Yeah, um, just uh, briefly um, uh, following up on um, <clears throat> the Saskia's um, uh, you know, observation about how uh, funding is used to control you know, uh, the, the subjects of research and scholarship. An another way of doing this is also through issuance or denial to issue entry visas to countries. You know, as you know, uh, Benedict Anderson, the late Anderson, uh, was banned from um, Indonesia for the longest time. And uh, also, you know, in, in, in my own, um, you know, uh, birth country of Burma, 
uh, the, the visas were extremely restricted to a few uh, scholars and researchers from outside uh, Burma. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, say for instance, during the military period, uh, so people like uh, Robert Taylor uh, was one of the very, very few people who was uh, who were allowed in and given access to army archives and whatnot. And then, sure enough. You know, you don't bite your uh, bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> you know, no. you don't attack the regime that no. um, you know uh, gave you special visa to come in and do research. And so, you know, the the scholarship was extremely slanted uh, uh, the, uh, the to in favor of the military. And and today we have uh, something called Burma Studies Group. And uh, you know, the field um, uh, or the subfield uh, would have hundreds of uh, uh, scholars, if not thousands. And then, you know, the, you will, you can counter with your uh, one hand how many Burma studies experts uh, uh, have, uh, you, know, speak, uh, you know, spoken out on the country, um, you know, that is committing a, a genocide, you know, and, and it, this is very disturbing because this is actually, in my view, a betrayal of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the mission uh, as scholars that uh, we are to uphold the uh, highest standards of uh, ethical principles uh, in pursuit of uh, uh, truth uh, that may be uh, challenged later. But nonetheless, we strive to establish, uh, you know, what is, um, you know, truth, um, you know, however inconvenient or unpopular it may be. Uh, Mike, you have a hand or? Yeah, I was gonna contribute earlier. Um, one of the things, there are a number of different factors. We don't know who the stakeholders are and I'm not going to guess who they were in this particular case. But one of the one of the problems that exists for Southeast Asian universities is that a lot of the um, the indigenous scholars, national scholars, are very uh, focused on their own countries, and they they often don't have very great connections with people in other countries. So they often rely on the advice of uh, of Western scholars who've been brought in as who who get brought in, stay there for ten or twenty years, become form a network, and uh, and become gatekeepers. And this group is often, my personal experience is this group has often been extremely conservative and worried about wanting to use like NUS as their base, but keep their connections with the Thai government going or keep their connections with the Burmese government going. And so they are often the ones whispering in the ears of university administrators who don't know better, hey, you need to not publish this book after they learn it's being published. Yeah, Mesro, please. Yes. Uh, just just to kind of uh, uh, further extend this uh, concept of or, or play off this concept of language and the creation of say larger audiences or the need to kind of transcend national boundaries when studying um, the, the social sciences of, or social sciences within these countries, it seems to me that there is a problem in that people in the Philippines don't know much about. Thailand, people in Indonesia know very little about Burma, even though they perhaps should know more than they do. And I think the teaching agenda, to leave research aside, research and publication aside, the teaching agenda in Southeast Asian studies must find common transnational themes within the Southeast Asian region. Something that I'm kind of toying with is the notion of, again, counterinsurgency against leftist groups, which is a very common uh, unfortunate phenomenon right through Southeast Asia, from Burma all the way to Timor-Leste. Uh, the, the notion that states engineer common forms of control, repression, manipulation, and misinformation is something I think that has to be broadcast across uh, national boundaries, because it is a common theme, and indeed common forms of civil science, civil society, and its resistance to that. Uh, Vince Boudreau has written one of the very few books on uh, protesting dictatorship and democratization and civil society organizations in places like Burma, the Philippines, and Indonesia. What I think has to happen among people like us is we have to broadcast and advertise common experiences. Uh, it could be counterinsurgency, it could be crony capitalism, it could be predatory politics, it could be uh, misgovernance. But all of these uh, themes have to be given, I think, wider, wider voice in, in academies, both in the West, because there are many, many Southeast Asians in the uh, United States, certainly, that need to know that uh, a, a Indonesian American has things in common historically with a Filipino American and so on and so forth. 
but also within Southeast Asia itself. I think that, that um, needs them. Your point taken. Um, Saskia, um, I saw your hand earlier. Would you like to comment? I just want to uh, add on what you were saying about uh, uh, Ben Anderson. He, at one stage, he was, uh, he was given a visa and he went uh, to Indonesia after a long, long time, as you said. Uh, but then he was turned back by the immigration. So, it, so they were just, I mean, teasing him. Uh, I myself, by the way, was also blacklisted for 13 years until 1998. So they were doing that very uh, regularly. Now, Pop, um, um, following up from what Ms. Rob and also what uh, you were saying, Zarni, uh, earlier is, is that um, like in Indonesia, as uh, Ms. Rob said, um, Southeast Asian studies is hardly there but also particular forms of study topics are not uh, taught. And history, a history department, for instance, are very few in Indonesia because history is particularly the kind of studies, of course, that could go into building these links and go into the own history of, in this case, then genocide and impunity. Um, and history scholars in Indonesia, historians are not respected. When you are a historian, you are a lowly kind, you're, you're a lowly kind of academic, right? And there are very few historians who are actually able to, uh, to, to do the field of studies um, it, for which they are uh, uh, trained. Like, I mean, a, a, a good historian, actually a pro very progressive historian, uh, was banned for a long time from, in, from, from teaching. And when he was finally able to teach again, he was told he could not teach history. So there is really a problem all across the board, across from universities, from state, uh, from the military still controlling uh, university boards, all these kinds of things. We are up against an enormous uh, multi-headed uh, dragon, right? But I think uh, we should do that and we should prepare ourselves for these kinds of struggles. And this campaign that we are doing right now uh, uh, on, uh, on Pavin's book, I think that will alert a lot of people to the things that are going on in Southeast Asia and uh, that will progress uh, uh, the course of uh, critical studies across the board in, uh, in all of Southeast Asia. So thank yeah. you, Pavin, for bringing us uh, to, to this uh, topic. Yeah, uh, just a, a, a brief comment. I, I think the, um, you know, the uh, institutions of power, influence, and uh, economic interest, they're often they're intertwined, you know, uh, you know, whatever the civilization or the e uh, political epoch we might be in. And so, you know, uh, in, in China, for instance, like going back to Confucius era, there were, uh, you know, China was uh, uh, one of the earliest known civilizations that engaged in a burning of books, yeah, uh, whatever format uh, the books are, and uh, the ancient Greek or the, uh, um, the Soviet Russia, uh, the military ruled uh, dictator uh, <clears throat> countries across the world. I think what for scholars um, uh, need to understand is that, um, you know, what is scholarship for, you know, and, and, and also the other one, historians or sociologists or, or, or social scientists, uh, we need to decouple our work from the idea and loyalty and allegiances to nation states. And it's clear, like, you know, the, even sticking with the example of ASEAN states, that has essentially stupefied, uh, you know, about 600 million humans. I mean, think about it. What a waste of collective brain power if our own citizens are not nurtured to think for themselves and, and to, uh, you know, to, to pursue uh, the basically human and societal flourishing. And that is what has been going on for half a century since ASEAN's emergence. Uh, Mike, I, I saw your hand. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment. Uh, the other thing about this too is that I, I would like to see how many Singaporean academics actually sign Pavan's petition because we won't, we're talking about what we do, but actually the important thing here is, is there that critical space? Is there that counter space within universities in Southeast Asia that are sufficiently autonomous that they can stand up to this? It shouldn't be about us having a pro protest. They should be having a protest. And if they're not able to, you know, what we can, can we do to help them have that 
autonomy. Oh, thanks, thanks, Michael, for uh, bringing bringing this up because I forgot I supposed to say something. So in in the first batch when I sent email when I sent email to everyone, uh, I omitted those who work in Singapore and those in particular working for MUS. But then in the second batch, I thought, why do I have to omit? I mean, this could also be a good a test, you know, for them as well. So that's why, in in my second email, I include almost all my friends at ISIS and also NUS. But you know what? Up to this point, none of them from Singapore has supported this campaign. There is only one friend from who who's teaching at NUS, basically dropping a private message to say that I wanted to help, but I can't because I am this organization. So I think that is a very good observation. Then of, they're they're not here the, there yet then. Exactly. I mean, yeah. up up to this point, no one who work in Singapore institute institutions has registered their name in this campaign. Well, that is that is truly shocking. Uh, mm. Even though uh, you know it may be expected, because you know this is a very dangerous uh, situation. Actually, it, it it has like a regional implications, and and even I would say like global because. Uh, you know, Thai, Thai scholarship is not confined to, uh, you know, Southeast Asian study and uh, Thai um, uh, <clears throat> uh, academics. If you look at, you know, CM Matt, uh, the Tong Chai's uh, classic, uh, it has, uh, you know, intellectual I impact on, uh, you know, pe uh, people who study other regions and, you know, contributes to the rise of a nationalism, uh, nation state, and, uh, you know, in, in so far as Thailand. And so I think, you know, the, the Singapore is in a very, very, uh, you know, uh, influential position, you know, uh, although it's a small city state, uh, it, because of its financial might and, 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 and its political savvy, it, it has built up the National University of Singapore uh, into one of the very best in, in Southeast Asia, but it cannot continue to retain this status if it begins to engage in this kind of academic uh, repression. You know, when um, the, I, I saw the exchanges between, um, you know, the NUS press and, and, and Professor Pravin here, did it ever explain, number one, who the stakeholders are? Yeah? And second, did the NUS press ever give you specific intellectual and scholarly reason why they cannot publish your book? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there's no explanation. What could be a kind of explanation when we went through the process, the review process? Definitely, as you say, as you as yourself said, Sunny, this is not on the academic ground whatsoever. It has to be political pressure, and I doubt it that they would come out to review. You know who the stakeholders are. I don't. I. I, I mean, I don't think that would be possible. But. But I, I did send uh, the revised letter, uh, bring in incorporating you know some input you know from uh, Professor Penny Edwards at Berkeley and also uh, Philip Hurt you know from uh, Sydney, which also raised uh, the issue of stakeholder. Who are the stakeholder? You have to inform us you know. Otherwise you know whatever you said on your website at NUS Press about transparency that would not be trans that's transparent. Uh, yeah, I guess. And the other one is the, is the reason. I don't think we will ever get any reason. Tong Chai raised this issue about the explanation. Even in the statement of NUS press, there's nothing to show, you know, to, to, to them, uh, to, to inform us about uh, what kind of explanation behind the decision. Yeah, that's why I think the, the National University of Singapore, uh, the, which I, I would think will have a final say in what uh, you know goes out of NUS Press, right? Uh, but Peter, uh, uh, the, the the publisher, uh, answers to the um, you know NUS president and the entire administration. But this is not the first time, or I, I would say, isolated incident because NUS was embroiled in in its uh, you know Yale NUS joint program you know, banning certain types of lectures mm. that are legitimately scholarly and academic in the past. And, and, and I think that to contrast the, uh, the, the contrast between uh, the Yale University Press and NUS Press is, cannot be like a sharper because I understand um, from various reports 
uh, the Thai authorities um, uh, even you know, approach George W. Bush, a uh, yes. Yale alumnus, yes. to to block the uh, the release of uh, uh, Paul Hendley's um, "The King Never Smiled." Uh, NUS, um, uh, sorry, uh, Yale yeah. University Press, um, you know, upheld the academic freedom and went ahead and published it. Here, uh, you know, NUS Press basically um, uh, cracked, uh, but you know, uh, uh, conceivably, conceivably under. Uh, pressure from Thai authorities. I mean, you, we, 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 we have. So you are calling for, and we are supporting, moratorium on the, uh, you know, academics and scholars uh, <clears throat> from reviewing manuscripts uh, from NUS Press for the next five years. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So we are not right. asking people to boycott NUS nope. press per se. We are asking fellow scholars and independent scholars uh, not to review NUS press manuscripts for the yep. next five years until and unless NUS press, you know, comes up with a credible, yep. legitimate and valid mm -hmm. explanation as to why it dropped without explanation of um, the manuscript. Well, and that's also, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's right, Sunny. I, I just want to emphasize that it's, I mean, it's not, even though I use the term boycott right at the beginning, but now it's, it's since we already started uh, this kind of campaign, so it will not be boycott per se, but it would be the rejection of the invitation to review the manuscript. This is uh, according to Michael Herzfeld saying uh, he sort of uh, argued that this, would, this will not hurt you know, uh, those who already published with NUS, we still, you know, support the book come out of NUS. But from now on, we just want to make the process a bit more difficult for them. Yeah, for for uh, as an organization of uh, scholars and act, uh, or engaged scholars and activists uh, across Southeast Asia, um, yeah, we as 4C, uh, 4C .co, we would invite all the scholars, whether you are tied to academic institutions or independent scholars and activists working uh, on production of uh, uh, truth regimes and knowledge analyses. We would welcome uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, essays, uh, policy briefs, uh, even manuscripts, uh, if you will, in the future. Uh, that that may not be, uh, you know, accepted by university presses. We we would serve as an alternative, uh, you know, center uh, to 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 encourage, you know, both indigenous and exogenous uh, scholarships and analysis. And, and so we are uh, a very early, a very young organization, or more like a network. We would like to invite all of you to contribute in various forms. Um, artwork, uh, you know, poetry, um, essays, analyses, whatever. Uh, Pavin um, is in charge of our, uh, you know, multimedia site, and we would use it uh, as a way to promote um, unpalatable and unpopular truths, uh, you know, uh, in multiple languages. And so if the, okay, um, final thoughts, everyone, um, before we um, uh, uh, call this to a close? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, uh, Professor Chane in Soez, uh, Dr. Mestro Bativarian in Los Angeles, Professor Saskia Weringer in The Hague, uh, Professor Ramon Bowman Gilamo in Manila, and Professor uh, Pavin in Kyoto. Uh, the, the, on behalf of 4C, uh, I thank all of you uh, for making uh, 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 this event possible. And thank you and have a, a great day.